Good morning, everybody. God bless you and welcome to London Family Centre. If you're joining us for the first time, a special welcome to you. You can join us every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, a few quick announcements to London Family Centre. The meetings this coming week are at the same time, same days, Wednesdays and Fridays. Also, we have a few special seminars coming up, so Sandra will make announcements on the different WhatsApps groups through this coming week. So keep your eye on the WhatsApp groups. Welcome again in Jesus' name. Today's message, don't be frightened by the title. <laughs> Today's message is called Doomed or Destined? Doomed or Destined? There's a very famous saying in this world. Every one of you will know it. It's this. If we do not learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. If we do not learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. They have a chat show in America, which is a group of historians that go on TV every week and they talk about world history. Guess what the chat show's called? It's called Doomed. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. But it is true. Uh, if, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. I studied Irish history when I was in school, and I'm sure it would have been your you know, subject generally in whatever country you, you came from. There's many history books in this world, but there's no history book like the Bible. The Bible is utterly exceptional and totally unique. It is unlike every other history book. And the reason is it starts earlier and it finishes later and it's predictive. It, it, it tells you what's going to happen. It's an incredible book. And one of the things you'll see if you study the characters in Scripture who were effective, the people used a lot by God, mostly by God, nearly every single one of them show that they had a huge understanding of their history. It was something that was a foundation for their faith. So history for me is a big, big deal, you know. In Deuteronomy, you will see this illustrated in Moses when they come out of Egypt, which represents the world and, and hell, and they're going into the promised land, or they were supposed to, which represents heaven, salvation. And in Deuteronomy is that middle point, that bridging time. And from chapter 1 to 31, Moses repeatedly tells them about their history. He warns them. In fact, the word he uses the most is the word remember. Remember what happened when you rebelled. Remember how things went wrong. Remember what happened when we served the Lord. Remember how he brought us victory. Remember, remember, remember. And so for me, history is a very important topic, very important subject for us to get a grip on. Stephen, in the book of Acts, when they were going to stone him and kill him, what faith that man had. And they gave him an opportunity to speak before they killed him. And Stephen, straight off the top of his head, no notes, no preparation, Stephen was able to just go back in history, and in, an, an, an astonishing chapter where he goes through all the major events that brought them up to now you killing me today, and Stephen dies. Wow. You know, when Solomon came to the throne, God spoke many things to Solomon, but one of the things he, he warned Solomon, learn from your father David. Learn from his history. When Joshua came to power, God spoke many things to Joshua, but one of the things he told Joshua, learn from Moses. Learn from the mistakes he made and don't repeat them. If you don't learn from them, you're doomed to repeat them. This year, 2020, without a doubt, is one of the most significant years historically in all of history. I don't, this is proving to be an outstanding year, a very significant year. I think if Moses was alive in London today, we have a place where you can preach in public and it's called Hyde Park. I think Moses, if he was here, he would probably be down in Hyde Park and he would be encouraging us to remember. Look back. Look back. And look what's happened this human race. Don't make these same mistakes again. Learn from them. And just yesterday, the last couple of days, I've been thinking about this thought. What are the big lessons that we need to learn from history? What can you learn? I think it's wise to stop a moment in this significant year and think, what do I need to learn so I don't make the mistakes of my forefathers so that I enter my destiny and not doomed? The first big current point to me 
that we need to learn from history is that the rapture will come the rapture of the church is going to come and we can't wish it away we can't pretend it's not there we wouldn't be the first people to do that the rapture for those of you who don't know is the removal of the church from the earth the scripture says that Jesus comes back for his his bride for those who are filled with the spirit and he takes them to meet him in the air it's called the rapture of the church there are two significant events big events coming up in the future one is the rapture and the other one is the second coming of Christ these are two separate events the rapture first and then subsequently the second coming of Christ concerning the second coming of Christ no man knows the day or the hour we don't know when that's going to happen but concerning the rapture we know a little because the Apostle Paul says the rapture will take place when the last trumpet is blown during the Feast of Trumpets, which happens every September. It's a Jewish feast. It's a, the, the blowing of the trumpets signifies the coronation of the king. <laughs> so one of these Septembers going forward, one year, it's going to be that year. We just don't know which year. So when you talk like this, people think you're crazy. People mock you. People laugh at you. I'm not talking just about the lost. I'm talking about the saved. People just don't get it. They don't realize because they don't look at history. Look at Noah. Noah said a great, a great judgment is coming on the earth and I'm going to build an ark and I'm going to be raptured above the flood. Well, they laughed at Noah. They laughed and they laughed and they laughed because in those days there was no rain. There was no rain on the earth. The earth was watered by springs that came out of the earth. <coughs> water, the water was held in the air like a firmament. It must have been beautiful. But then the flood did come and bang the waters broke down upon the embryo of the earth the waters came flooding in and that's where we get our oceans from today and when you're looking at the ocean you're looking at the flood of noah not much laughing now how many people survived those waters eight very few how many people entered the promised land from the original number two so they wouldn't listen to moses they didn't listen to noah they didn't listen to Jesus. Jesus came warning of a coming judgment, warning that he would die for our sins, that he would be buried, he would be resurrected, and he would be raptured back to the Father. They laughed at him until it happened. And here we find ourselves today. So my first point to you this morning, saints or lost, no matter who you are listening, there will be a rapture. And in 2 Peter, the Apostle Peter says, don't worry when men mock you and laugh at you this has always been the case and Peter warns know this in the last days many scoffers will come saying where is your Christ where is this Lord it's a long time isn't it and Peter says don't worry about that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise but he is being patient not wanting anyone to perish but giving you a chance to turn in repentance and I invite you to do that today Turn to Christ today. Learn from the lessons of, of Moses, from the lessons of Noah, from the lessons of Jesus. And know that just as all these raptures have taken place, this one will also take place. Prepare for it and do it today. My second great lesson from history as I look back is this. Tipping points come. Tipping points come. They do come. And people think they don't come. They think they can avoid them. Or they mess around on, on the brink of tipping points, which is a dangerous thing to do. For example, in, in a marriage, I have had the honor and the privilege and the joy of rescuing many marriages who were at the tipping point of divorce. They're just at the point where they're going to break up, you know. And you, you're able to go in there and you pull the guy aside. You know, maybe he's being so bad, so bad, repeatedly, repeatedly. And you warn him, look at what happened to these other people who did this. Eventually they came to a tipping point and then they weren't able to fix it. And some people listen and they're able to be restored. But some people do not listen. They pass the tipping point. It's the same with wars, First World War, Second World War. Both started with tipping points. And indeed in America today, classic example of this condition. The United States of America, much of the current journalism and investigative uh, reporting that's going on is the question is this is America past the tipping point are they passing the point of no return towards a civil war 
It only takes so much and suddenly you're over the line. Pray for America, by the way. Really, please do. The election is on November the, the, the 3rd. So pray every day between now and then. Pray for peace and protection upon the citizens of the United States of America. Pray for them as a nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not all tipping points are bad. Some tipping points are good and brings you from bad to good. I, I grew up in Northern Ireland where there was terrible killing and war all my life, my childhood. Uh, I left when I was 17 and all those 17 years were non-stop warfare and bombings. Many thousands of people were killed. And I can remember as a young man thinking, will we ever have peace? Will this ever switch? And you know, it did. It did. It was an occasion called the Oma Bomb. It was a beautiful sunny day, summer holidays. All the families were out in the middle of Oma. That's where my mother comes from, the city of Oma. And they were all walking, enjoying the end of their summer holidays. And the terrorists put a huge bomb right there in the middle of the street in front of, amongst all the civilians. And boom, 28 people died instantly. And it caused such revulsion that it brought Northern Ireland to a tipping point. And for the first time, all the politicians of all persuasions, all the terrorists of all persuasions sat down round the table and began to talk about peace and praise God, a famous agreement, the Good Friday Agreement was signed by everybody and we've entered into now about 20 years of, of peace that I just never saw coming. Praise God for it. Long may it continue. So tipping points are not all bad. They learn from their history. The people of Northern Ireland thought, what good has this done? Let's stop this now let's stop this while we can still get out of it and thank god for the collective wisdom of the people of northern ireland god bless northern ireland also i studied church history at cardiff university it's one of my choices because i thought it was a very important very important topic excuse me a very important subject and after studying church history and the the, the history of israel I constructed this little chart as a kind of a synopsis of Israel's history, but also my history and your history also. And this is how it goes. We need to learn from this. God gave Israel enormous grace. They were walking in grace. And if you were born again this morning, God's given you great grace. So kind, so forgiving. But Israel abused the goodness of, of, of God and the grace of God. And they fell from grace. And they entered into another attribute of God, which is called faithfulness. Now, when faithfulness turns up in a life, it's a sign that something's wrong. Faithfulness shouldn't be necessary. I'll give you an example of what I mean by, by that. I had a pastor's group, but six or seven pastors. We used to meet every single week, and they were very happy men. But one day, one of the pastors comes in, and he's not a happy chappy this day. He's got a face like thunder, and his arms are folded, and I need to start the meeting. So I say, what's wrong? And he said, nothing. <laughs> so I said, what's wrong? And he, his reply stuck in my mind. He said, I'm here, aren't I? I'm here. Uh, uh, uh. I'm faithful, aren't I? Yeah, but that very statement shows me that there's some underlying problem, and that's the problem with faithfulness we shouldn't really need it so Israel moved from they fell from grace they ended up in the faithfulness of God but then they abused this they abused God's faithfulness his long suffering and because he's a holy God he had to judge them and they came under severe judgment over and over and over again they came under judgment the judgment was so bad that they repented of their sin and then they would come back into a place of grace. And around and around this circle they would go. Now, the trouble is, these two things particularly, repentance and grace, they concern this life. There is no need for repentance in heaven because there's no sin. So repentance is really an earthly thing. It's a temporary thing. And faithfulness, you don't need faithfulness where there is no sin, right? So at the end of time, we're going to see humanity separated into two groups. Those who are destined and those who are doomed. 
This is what Jesus came to tell us. And he came to offer you and me grace. Excuse me. And if we are wise, we will heed the warnings of God. And we will learn from the history of others, which is very severe. Destined or doomed. Please, this morning, learn from history. Learn from Israel. It says that the nation of Israel was given to the world as an example for us to see and for us to learn from. And I pray we do that this morning. Third great lesson from history for me is this. Don't ignore the prophets. <coughs> Excuse me. End times is not always a popular topic because when you tell the truth of scripture, it's often what people don't want to hear. They, it sounds like bad news for them. When you read Matthew chapter 24 and you're talking about plagues and earthquakes and disasters, it's not exactly good news. The, the current world so much wants to hear about prosperity and my best life, my, all of this stuff. Unfortunately, times, uh, world history is coming to a conclusion. And um, we need to wake up to that and see it. And God will send prophets and has sent prophets. Israel, Israel, oh you who killed the prophets. And one of the lessons of history, don't ignore prophets. You know, I had a very, very good friend of mine. He was a member in our church. He had his own independent ministry. I didn't know his ministry very well. He had 10 leaders or whatever connected with him. And he was very successful, very good guy. And I loved him, actually. He was, he, he's dead now. He was a great member. And one day I was, I was praying and I saw one of his leaders. I didn't know the guy. So I rang my member and I said, can I meet you for coffee? And I met my friend, my member, and I said, you know one of your leaders? I saw him in a vision. And God said to me to warn you that he is a Judas. He's a Judas to you. This is very strong. But that's what I saw and that's what I heard and it was clear. So I told my friend, but listen to this. He didn't like that. <laughs> he didn't like what I had to say. And he sort of turned against me right there. I said, no, 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 he's not a Judas, no, no. In fact, my friend said to me, in a few months time, I'm handing my whole ministry over to this man. Oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. I'm handing the whole ministry, he's the one I trust. I'm just, I'm just a postman, okay? Don't shoot the messenger, just a postman. So I'm just telling you, this is what I felt I heard, I'll leave it with you. But my friend continued, you know, he didn't heed the word. And he handed the ministry over to it in an event. And my friend handed the ministry, handed the documents, and he went out of politeness, he went and sat at the back. Lo and behold, right at that moment of the man's inaugura inauguration as the leader of the group, he took the group away from him and took it to an entirely different organization. So my friend came by, I remember him with, with his, ha his head in his hands, just mourning, why did I trust him? Why didn't I listen to you? Because you didn't learn from history. People don't listen to prophets very often. And then they suffer severe consequences. And that's what Moses was saying when they were looking at the promised land. That's what Noah was trying to say, you need to listen. That's what Jesus came to tell us. You need to listen and you need to learn and not make the same mistakes. And that's what I'm telling you today. The rapture will come. The second coming will come and judgment will happen. And this human race is destined for two destinations. Some will be doomed and some are destined for salvation. Make sure of your salvation. Learn from history. Number four, big lesson from history. Competition is biological, but spiritual submission is spiritual. It's a big lesson. Competition is biological. The human race is competitive. We're built like that. My, my, my wife and I were out for a prayer walk the other evening and there were two twins in the park and they were coming past us again and again. They were about six years old, two boys, and they both obviously received new bikes. Now, what happens when you give two six-year-old boys two new bikes? <laughs> Do they go around the park and enjoy the, the trees? No. 
competition. Let's see who can ride the fastest. And it was one competition after another between these two twins. Competition's biological. And we need to get it under control. They call it the survival of the fittest, or it goes by many names. And even people will say to you, oh, pastor, I, you know, I'm not competitive. I'm part of a team. <laughs> the trouble with teams is teams compete with teams. That's where football is, right? You plant a church and the church competes with another church. Or you're part of a race and this race is, is in competition with this race to prove itself superior. Or part of a culture and you try to exalt your culture over another culture. All of that is coming from a root within us of competition. And it leads to wars, it leads to divisions, leads to strife and trouble. And one of the big lessons of all history is competition between us doesn't end well. And Jesus invites you, no matter what color you are, what culture you come from, what church you're in, Jesus invites you not to be competitive at this earthly level, but to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, where there is no competition because we're all serving one God. One of the lessons of history, when you start to see the manifestations of this root called competition, be careful of your behavior and pray for God to kill that root and to give you a kingdom mind and kingdom motivations in Jesus name. Big lesson number five from history. Seek truth and embrace it. Seek truth and embrace it because the lie is going to kill you. You can pretend you know the truth but I'm just going to pretend I believe this and all the time you know what the truth is. It's the truth that sets us free. And, you know, I don't have to like the things I can see in Scripture. I don't have to like them. There are many things in Scripture I don't like, but I believe them. And I accept them with my limited knowledge here as a human being. How foolish I would be to question God in these issues. So there are many theological issues. I don't have to like it, but I need to believe it. And I need to accept it. And as a minister, I need to preach it, even if I don't like it. Accept the truth. This is a lesson of history, a big lesson. Seek the truth, accept the truth, and embrace the truth. I had to have let one of my staff go a few years ago because there was a definite theological truth believed by all churches. <laughs> but this young man had an agenda. And this specific theological truth didn't quite fit his agenda. He wasn't happy with it. So he decided to push it to one side and proceed without embracing that and it became evident in his ministry so I said look you either change this or I'm gonna change your job you're not gonna be working here and he couldn't change it wouldn't change it so I had to let him go be, be very careful of that okay embrace truth for me th this is currently a, a major crisis in the world many people because I work in many different countries and I was thinking this morning to get an accurate um, number here but probably in the last 15 months I've sat with around 10 leaders who have rejected some truth or another and preferred a lie. Be, be very careful of that, guys. Even if the truth hurts, accept it. Even if you don't like it, accept it. Okay? Even embrace it. Because the lie will kill you. The truth will set you free. And by the way, if you reject truth, who is the truth? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Many historically have rejected him to their peril. Embrace truth. Embrace truth. Accept it in Jesus' name. Seventhly, seven big, big lessons, seventh big lesson from history. Don't follow the crowd. Many people can attract a crowd. But maybe there's suspicion, suspicious means of doing so. But many people can attract a crowd or they can have perceived success they can very good at, at the presentation of worldly success be very careful of that history shows us stalin had huge crowds following him until he killed multiple millions hitler had enormous crowds when they stood jesus and barabbas before a huge crowd the crowd shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Don't follow 
the crowd. You're called to follow Jesus. Don't follow the crowd. In fact, don't even be part of a crowd. Don't be part of a club or a gang or a party. Be part of the kingdom of God. A much higher calling I have. A much more noble calling you have and I have who are born again. So get these things out of your system, out of your motives. Historically, they've done no good to anybody and they won't do you any good either. Learn from the lessons of the past. And eighthly and lastly, history tells us when I think I'm something special, I'm in a very dangerous place. Do you know there was great war in Israel one day and all the soldiers went to battle. Many of them were being killed to try and protect Israel. But a very special King David decided that he was so special he would just stay at home and that ended incredibly badly you know the story he ended up a murderer and adulterer because he felt he was he felt the rules didn't apply to him anymore history tells us that when people start feeling that they're different or special it doesn't end well one of the biggest and most famous evangelists in modern times is a man called Jim Baker he had the largest TV program and ministry in the world. Now that's pretty big. But Jim Baker ended up in prison uh, for a long time. He was in, accused of uh, many crimes, many fraud crimes, adultery, many, many, many problems that he got involved in. And he ended up in complete disgrace. He lost everything in bankruptcy. And the prophet John Bevere wrote a book uh, containing some information about this. He went to see Jim Baker in prison and he, he asked Jim Baker this question, when did you stop loving God? And Jim Baker said, never. I never stopped loving God. I always loved God. Even when I was deep in sin, I always loved God. That wasn't my problem. My problem is I did not fear God. I lost my fear of God and if I had continued with no fear I would have ended up in hell even though I loved God I had no fear of God I think it's ironic in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 the wisest man who ever lived his life was full of experiences Solomon but at the end of Solomon's you know assessment of life and history in Ecclesiastes 12 13 Solomon says the conclusion of the matter is this fear the Lord fear the Lord and obey his commands very wise words Jim Baker by the way repented came back to the Lord and is currently back on TV again a much changed person I know many worship leaders I know many worshipers in many countries I don't doubt that you love the Lord but I question whether you fear him that's a dangerous place to be I know many pastors many and I don't doubt you love the Lord but do you fear him the fear of the Lord turns a man from evil will protect your path I know many Christians and I don't doubt that they love the Lord but my concern is do you fear him loss of the fear of the Lord has shown us historically to bring people to a bad place and we should learn that lesson that's it those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it and I pray that God Almighty impart to us this morning wisdom and grace. Grace, the empowering grace of God to not just love him, but to fear him and to be a people who are prepared for the rapture and for the second coming of Christ. Folks, I don't apologize if today this is heavy, okay? I don't apologize. Read Matthew chapter 24, the words of Jesus. That's quite heavy, okay? Read the Apostle Paul. It's quite heavy. And a lot of what's happening in the world is not going to help you. It's not going to help you. And I don't doubt I'll be criticized, laughed and mocked at for what I've said today. But I've only said what my forefathers said before me. And I've only uh, reaffirmed the words of Jesus and Paul and Peter and all those who entered their destiny 
and avoided damnation. And I pray that for you. I pray it for me. So join me this morning. Stand in your homes. Stand in your homes. Each person alone. And each of you. Let me begin with those who perhaps don't know Jesus Christ. You saw how God offered grace to Israel. Well, the same God is alive and well. And as we have time alive on this earth, I strongly advise you, turn to the Lord today. You need to repent of your sin. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and receive that salvation. Just do that right now. Pray to God, Father, I repent of the sins in my life and I take this opportunity to turn to you and receive my salvation in Jesus' name. For those of you who are saved out there and maybe you love the Lord and I understand that, but perhaps the fear of God has to some degree decreased or even diminished in your life. Father, I pray for the restoration of the fear of the Lord in our lives. That fear of the Lord will keep us from evil and keep us on the paths of righteousness. Bless your people. Secure us in these last days. And I pray we will begin with wisdom to prepare for the coming of our Lord and our King, Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for praying with me. Drop us a line. If you have any questions or comments, go to our webpage. Just send us an email. We'll be more than happy to communicate with you. God bless you. We love you. Bye.